click the bell icon to turn on notifications. We've made the files the instructor uses in this tutorial available for free. Just click the link below in the video details to get these. Hello and welcome to this course. My name is Faizan and I'll be your coach in this series on Agile Scrum training. Before we move on to defining Scrum and its components, I would like to briefly introduce myself. I've been in the corporate sector for the past eight years, and I've helped numerous organizations get the best out of their teams, and that too, with least amount of waste and increasing productivity over time. And how exactly have I been able to do that? That is why you're here, to learn Scrum. So how do we define Scrum? Scrum is a lightweight, iterative, and incremental framework for developing, delivering, and sustaining complex products. Now you might think, what does this definition actually mean? So I'll just put it into an example. Assume that we are trying to launch a software, for example, a WhatsApp. So it's a chatting app, very popular. There are many functions in it, right? We have the chat function, we have the group function, we have the communities function, the status function, and if our client who is trying to get it made from my company wants it made within, let's say, a year's time, obviously we need to create this over time and try to show it to the client as well. And how do you actually do it efficiently so that you have some working samples to send to your clients before the whole product is actually made and put into the market? For that, we put the Scrum framework to work. Now, using the same example of creating a WhatsApp app, let's look into the Scrum framework and its components and see how do we put the Scrum into action to make the deliveries quick and efficient for our client. So there are three main components of the Scrum framework. The first is the three Scrum roles, which includes the Scrum product owner, the Scrum team, and the Scrum master. The Scrum product owner is the one who is getting the product made in the first place. The Scrum team are people who are working on the project. These are the developers who are trying to create the WhatsApp product. And the Scrum master is a member of the team who's trying to lead all this. There is no specific project manager who is just looking over the project. This is a self-sustaining, self-organizing team here. The next component of the Scrum framework is the Scrum events or ceremonies. The first one is a Scrum grooming or backlog refinement meeting. Now, this is a meeting with your client where you list down all that is needed for your product, followed by the sprint planning meeting. Now, before we move on, let me define sprint. Sprint is the cycles of work activities that help you develop shippable software product or for that matter, any service over time to your client. So in short, this is a cycle of four days, five days, or even a week in which we will be working with our team and delivering a certain product to our client. So for example, in this case of WhatsApp production, we are trying to produce the first chat function. This will be the first sprint. We might look into another week and try to produce the status update and then deliver it to the client as well. So in this case, we have delivered to the client two updates. The first one is the chat function. The second one is the status update. And another sprint goes on, another week goes on, for example, and then we deliver to them the community function. So what exactly are we doing here? We are trying to create smaller pieces of workable product and delivering it to our client over time, instead of waiting all year to produce a final product that might just not be the finest version of itself by the end. So here we are incremental, we are making things over time and delivering it quicker so that the client can fix it, comment on it, and we can get to work and get this product up and running very quickly. The next meeting is the daily scrum meeting. This is a small stand-up meeting for three to five minutes if you are a physical team, or maybe a quick Zoom call where you can talk to your people, talk to your developers and see what's going on, if there's anything that they need to discuss and just get it done with very quickly. This is not going to be long, no long discussions, just a quick brief update. The next part is a sprint review meeting. This is where when you've done a certain period of work, 
for example, a week's work. This is your first sprint period. You deliver the product to your end client and you discuss with them what you've achieved so far. And the last meeting is a sprint retrospective meeting. This is where you try to look into what could be improved in your upcoming sprint, what was lacking in the previous delivery and what we need to do forward. Now, obviously, all this will be documented as well. So where do you put them? Into the artifacts, into the documents. Two of the most important documents in this case are the product backlog, which is an artifact, a document that is used to manage and prioritize all the known requirements of a Scrum project, followed by the sprint backlog, which is an artifact to keep the track of the requirements committed by the Scrum team for an upcoming or a given sprint. That is it for this lesson. We'll see you in the next one. Hello and welcome to this lesson. Today, we're going to talk about the Agile Manifesto and how it relates to the Scrum framework in the IT industry, and for that matter, other industries as well. So you might have heard the term Agile Scrum and Scrum used interchangeably, but they actually refer to the same thing. The Scrum framework engineering is what they refer to. So why do we sometimes use or add Agile in front of Scrum? Well, it's because the Scrum framework is based on the principles of Agile Manifesto. And here we start to define the Agile Manifesto. The Agile Manifesto is a set of values and principles that prioritize individuals, working software, customer collaboration, and responding to change over processes, documentation, contract negotiation, and following a plan. While both of these have value, the Agile Manifesto prioritizes the ones on the left a little higher than the ones on the right. So how does this relate to real life examples? Let's look at a business, for example, that creates software for a client. In the past, the software development process might have focused more on, uh, let's say, documentation or uh, following a rigid plan and negotiating contracts. However, by embracing the Agile Manifesto and the Scrum framework, the development team can prioritize collaboration with the client, responding to changes in the project, and working software over documentation and other contractual details. For example, imagine a client wants a new feature added to their software in the past, this might have involved going back and forth with the client to negotiate the terms of the changes, uh, maybe updating the documentation and sticking to a very strict plan. However, with the Agile Manifesto and Scrum framework, the development team can now directly talk to the client, collaborate with them, try to understand their needs and quickly implement the changes and deliver working software in a more timely manner. So this reduces all of the wastage of time when we're talking about documentation and writing things down. Another example is if it's a team, for example, working on a tight deadline. In the past, they might have focused more on following a rigid plan uh, and you know get everything done in time. However, with the Agile Manifesto and Scrum Framework, what can they do? They can prioritize collaboration and responding to changes allowing them to adapt to the new plan and, and, and adjust to the requirements of the deadline accordingly. So in this case, also reducing wastage of time. If I summarize all this, the Agile Manifesto and Scrum Framework prioritizes, like I said before, individuals, working software, customer collaboration, and responding to changes over, like I mentioned earlier, processes, documentation, contract negotiation, and following a plan. Embracing these values in your business and development teams can create value for your clients. And it helps you enhance the, the profession of software engineering and other processes for that matter in itself, and helps you deliver better results overall. And that's all about the Agile Manifesto. And this brings us to the end of our lesson. In the next lesson, we are going to start learning about how to organize your team and make it more efficient. This is it for now. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to another episode. And in this episode, we're trying to learn how to organize your Scrum team. 
And in your Scrum team, the first important part that you're going to learn about is self-organization, which is a critical component of the Scrum framework in itself, where the team members get to decide amongst themselves what tasks they need to execute in order to achieve the sprint goal. It's a powerful concept, which allows the team to work autonomously and without the need for a traditional manager or team leader. So self-organization is the heart of the Scrum framework. Now, this self-organization in the Scrum framework is highly disciplined and requires a few um, foundational elements, which are, for example, the sprint backlog, the sprint brand down chart, and daily Scrum meetings. These components work together to ensure that the team is continuously working towards their sprint goals. So self-organization is achieved through these three logs. Uh, it's also essential to know that self-organization requires a learning phase. And competent Scrum masters who possess Scrum master certifications, they'll help the team to achieve self-organization as quickly as possible. They provide guidance and support to the team and ensure that they have the necessary tools to be successful. Self-organization also requires the ability to work together despite different opinions and possible conflicts amongst various team members. So conflict resolution is also an essential part. The team must have compliance and trust in joint decision-making processes. Without that, it won't work. These decision-making processes may include planning, estimation, implementing, reporting, and reviewing the work that the Scrum team is jointly responsible for. Now, to better understand self-organization, let's consider an example from the real world, okay? So, in this example, I'm considering a sports team that can self-organize and work together cohesively without really relying on the coach to micromanage every move. For instance, in a basketball team, a team that can self-organize effectively will execute plays without any cues from their coach, and they will make every quick decision that's required to outmaneuver the opponent team. Let's jump into the business world. So a self-organizing business team can lead to an increased productivity, better problem solving, and higher levels of engagement. For example, an advertising agency, let's suppose, that practices self-organization on the Scrum framework can quickly adapt to changes in the market. They would sit down and brainstorm new ideas, collaborate with each other. Now in the business world, for example, self-organization can lead to increased productivity, better problem solving skills, and higher levels of engagement. For instance, an advertising agency that practices self-organization using the Scrum framework can quickly adapt to changes in the market. They can brainstorm new ideas collaboratively, and execute new campaigns without excessive management oversight. So hence, there's no need of a project manager. Once again, to sum up all this, what we've discussed right now, self-organization is a critical component of the Scrum framework. And it enables teams to work autonomously and achieve their goals without the need for, like I said, a traditional manager or a traditional team leader. Now, how do they do this? They do this by prioritizing teamwork collaboration, and trust in the decision-making processes. And these teams can definitely then achieve better productivity and problem-solving overall. So at the heart of all the Scrum framework and organization, what you find is people who are responsible and really interested in organizing themselves. And this is pretty much what, an, uh, what a Scrum team would look like, a self-organizing, self-disciplined team which is ready to take on challenges without needing a lot of push from their managers. And that is it for this lesson. See you in the next one. Hello and welcome to another episode on examining and transforming your Scrum team. Have you ever felt like no matter how much planning you do, something always tends to go wrong? This is a common problem faced by many companies and project managers. These project managers often struggle to fully comprehend the bigger picture of complex systems 
and are unable to do reliable end-to-end -end planning. But what if I told you that there is a solution to this? Introducing Scrum Examine and Transform. The Scrum Examine and Transform is a pretty straightforward concept to understand, but it is one of the hardest to implement and master. It was developed by companies who recognized that their project managers were unable to see the bigger picture of complex systems and that they needed to try something different. Together with lean production, they developed a process to empower themselves strategically and to fix the course of action while they were running their projects and operations. One example of such a company that has really put in this Scrum Examine and Transform concept is Spotify. They use it to manage their software development and delivery frameworks. This approach has enabled Spotify to keep up with the competitors as well as stay innovative and create value for their customers. So what are the steps of Scrum Examine and Transform? Starting with step one, which is examine. Now this involves doing your best to grasp the current status of the project with your current level of know-how and understanding about it. Now this step is analogous to the sprint review meetings and sprint retrospective meetings. An example of how this step can be implemented in real life is through the use of a daily status report. Now, this report enables project managers to inspect the progress of the project on a daily basis. It also helps them identify any issues that need to be addressed. So that's the first part, examining what you are doing. Now, moving on to step two, which is transform. This step involves defining a direction and vision about the next steps of the project, and then strategizing and executing your vision. This is analogous to the sprint planning meetings and backlog refining meetings in the Scrum framework. An example of this can be how you could implement in the real life is through the use of uh, project plans, for example. The project plan provides a roadmap for the project, which helps project managers to transform and adjust their plans as needed over time. Step three is to learn. This step involves carefully observing, learning, and teaching each other while doing the work. It is analogous to the daily scrum meetings. An example of how this step can be implemented in real life is through the use of a lessons learned report. Now, this report provides a summary of what worked well and what didn't work well during a project. It also enables project managers to learn from their mistakes and ensure that they do not repeat them in the future projects. This brings us to step number four, which is restart. This step involves starting over from step one it is analogous to the closure of a sprint and the start of a new sprint. Now, for example, uh, this step can be implemented in real life uh, through the use of project postmortems. This is a meeting held after the project is complete to review the project's successes and failures. This also enables project managers to restart the process with a better understanding of what went well and what didn't go well and hence improve the whole process. In conclusion, if I must say, the Scrum Examine and Transform is a process that enables companies to learn from their mistakes, adapt to the changes that come across while they're doing the project, and improve their projects and operations. It is a continuous improvement process that helps companies stay competitive, innovative, and create value for their customers. So if you're struggling with end-to-end -end planning and want to try something different, consider implementing this Scrum framework in which you have the Scrum Examine and Transform helping you in your company. And how do you exactly do this? The four steps once again. Number one, examine. Number two, transform. Number three, learn. And number four is restart. This is it for this lesson. We'll see you in the next one. Welcome to this module on five key values and principles. 
While getting the Scrum certification is very important, it is not enough to achieve success in the Scrum framework in itself. You must also possess a firm grasp of the Scrum values to be able to deliver excellent results for your clients and employers. So in this module, we are trying to explore the five key values and principles of the Scrum framework. The first value is courage. Sometimes doing the right thing to serve clients' best interest is not easy. In such moments, the Scrum master, product owners, and team members should remember their duty to build the best possible products and services in their domain, even if it means making tough decisions that may not make everyone happy. To deal with these situations, the Scrum team must be courageous and must act accordingly. For example, an online retailer that courageously addresses its customers' complaints on social media by acknowledging their mistake and offering refunds would likely gain more customer loyalty and trust. And that is how you show courage in the Scrum framework. Now, the second value is focus. When we hear the value of focus in the Scrum framework, two things should come to your mind. The first one is identifying correct work. And the second is prioritizing it. The Scrum team, including the Scrum master and product owner, must continuously ask themselves, what are the most important things there are that we should be doing at any given moment? which should fulfill the employer's reason for hiring us in the first place. Now, the Scrum has built-in ceremonies that help us do this. For example, the Scrum grooming, the sprint planning, the daily Scrum, the sprint review, and sprint retrospective meetings. They help us prioritize user stories and tasks and help us ensure that the team works on the right things in the correct order. For example, a marketing agency that prioritizes its campaign's goals based on the customer's business objectives and target audience will have a higher likelihood of delivering more effective campaigns rather than them discussing what they have been doing before or what they believe is right. So focusing on what's right and doing it in the correct order is really important here. The next value is commitment. In the world of Scrum software development, commitment means the Scrum master, the product owner, and the team, they all are committed to delivering outstanding results with software. However, the term commitment, I must say, should be understood more like obsession within the context of Scrum values. To be successful in your software engineering processes and in life in general, you must become obsessed with your goals. Without an obsession with delivering high quality software. Even the slightest of impediment can slow down your work and create excuses. Therefore, becoming devoted to delivering remarkable software for your clients is critical to solving their problems effectively. And that's what this Scrum Value is all about. For example, a software development company that is devoted to developing and building softwares that solve customers' problems will be more successful in their meeting their clients' needs and ultimately achieving greater success rather than someone who's not really obsessed with doing it. The next value is respect. Now, respect is one of Scrum Framework's key values that emphasizes treating people with respect and dignity regardless of their background or status. Now, this means that everyone on the team should be heard and their contribution should be valued, right? This leads to increased collaboration, higher quality work, and greater satisfaction amongst team members. The next value is openness. Now, this is the fifth and final value of the Scrum framework, and it emphasizes the importance of being open to new ideas and ways of doing things. Now, this includes being transparent in all communications that you have and all processes, and also being willing to share knowledge and actively seeking out feedback. Now, this leads to continuous improvement, and it also increases collaboration and greater creativity. For example, 
a technology startup that is open to feedback from its customers and stakeholders, can more easily identify areas for improvement and create better products that meet the customer's needs. If I must conclude, it is mastering the Scrum framework values and principles that is really critical to achieving success in software engineering and professional businesses. And that brings us to the end of this section. Do attempt the quizzes and exercises so that you can solidify your concepts that you've learned so far. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you in the next section. Hello and welcome to the Scrum Value Team Challenge. In this exercise, you will be forming a team taking on roles associated with each of the five Scrum values and collaborating with each other to solve a problem using these values. Our goal is to help you better understand how these values really contribute to effective teamwork and decision making. So are you ready? Let's get started. So let's assign each one of you a role based on the Scrum values that we've studied in the previous episodes. Okay, so the first one is courage. Let's call you the champion for courage. Focus, and let's call you expert for focus. Commitment, and let's call you advocate for commitment. Respect, and I call you promoter for respect. And openness, you're the supporter for openness. Now that you have your roles, let's move on to the problem that you'll be solving all together. Now here's the problem your team needs to solve. Your company is developing a new software product, but you have discovered a major issue that will delay its release. Now your team needs to decide whether to delay the launch, release it with the issue, or find an alternative solution. Remember that you need to apply your assigned Scrum value to contribute effectively to the problem-solving process. Well, now it's time to collaborate and find a solution. Work together, and I want you to discuss the problem and potential solutions. You need to keep in mind that your assigned Scrum value when you're contributing to the discussion should be the leading factor for your suggestions and decision-making process. Take some time to yourself and try to suggest what would you do in this situation based upon your Scrum value that I've assigned you. You may choose to pause the video here and take some time to do this part of the exercise. Congratulations on finding a solution together. Your team has decided, for example, to delay the launch of the software product to fix the issue, ensuring a high quality product for the customers. Now let's take a moment to analyze how each one of you, as the courage champion, the focus expert, the commitment advocate, the respect promoter, and the openness supporter have contributed to this decision by embodying your respective Scrum values. Now, as a courage champion, this is what you would do. You stood up and openly addressed the issue, even though it would lead to a delay, but you did it. You encouraged the team to face the challenge head on and find the best solution for the customer rather than releasing a subpar product. Now, as a focus expert, you help the team concentrate on the main goal, which is delivering a high quality product by emphasizing the importance of addressing this critical issue that came up. You ensured that the team remained focused on what truly matters, and that is quality for your clients. As a commitment advocate, you demonstrated commitment by ensuring and encouraging the team to work together and find a solution. You reminded everyone of the importance of delivering a product that actually meets the customer's expectations and the team's commitment to excellence. As a respect promoter, you fostered a respectful atmosphere during this discussion, ensuring that everyone's opinion were heard and considered. Your emphasis on respecting different perspectives contributed to a collective decision-making process. So this collaboration was all because of you focusing on respect. Now, as an openness supporter, you encouraged open communication amongst the team members, allowing everyone to share what their thoughts on the topic were and what were their concerns. The openness has helped your team identify the best course of action to address this issue at hand. Great job, team. Now that you've reached a solution, let's all reflect on the problem-solving process and how your assigned Scrum value influenced your approach. Now take some time to reflect 
and share your thoughts within each other on this exercise. Thank you for participating in the Scrum Team Values Challenge. I really hope that this exercise provided you valuable insights into the importance of the Scrum values and when we're working in the team and making decisions. Also remember that you need to apply these values in your everyday work to foster a collaborative and effective environment using the Scrum framework. Keep practicing and you'll be on your way to becoming a successful Scrum team altogether. Good luck and we'll see you in the next section. Thank you for watching. For the next section, you'll want to download the course exercise files. Click the link below in the video description to get these. You can also scroll through the details to find timestamps for each section in this course. If you're enjoying this training, please leave us a comment. Hello and welcome to another section. And in this one, we're going to discuss the problems we faced before applying the Scrum framework. And there are three problems. Number one, planning the whole project before really understanding it. Problem number two, lack of devotion and teamwork amongst different departments. And problem number three, autocratic leadership versus democratic leadership. In the coming modules, we're going to discuss these in detail. So stay tuned. Hello and welcome to this lesson. And here we are going to discuss the first problem, which is planning the whole project before really understanding it. Now, over time, we faced a problem in our software development projects. And what was that? The need to plan the entire project before really understanding the project's requirements. Now, this often resulted in developing and delivering the wrong software and hardware product that did not really match or fulfill the client's needs. We had times when the third party companies would impose how we were supposed to produce or build our software products or how we were supposed to produce those services. Now to ensure that we build the software correctly, my company had to use some frameworks like the capacity maturity model, CMM, and ISO 9001, 2008. But the success of these frameworks is at this moment irrelevant to the Scrum process. We're going to focus more on how the Scrum has helped us uh, over time now. Now, before the Scrum framework that we applied, we used the waterfall software engineering model. Specifically says that you have recommended phases and you approach them in phases. Like we started with requirements analysis to understand our clients' needs and wants, followed by designing and then implementing the requirements. And then we tested things and then we maintained all of this in the production environments. However, there were unforeseen delays in one phase somewhere, and this had adverse effects on the following phases. And studies have shown that the waterfall methodology in itself was a critical factor in over 80% of failed software projects. So now that begs the question, why do we use this in the first place? The waterfall method had a strict sequential chain of project phases. And when I say that, what it means is where a previous phase had to be completed before starting off with the next phase. So going back was extremely painful, costly, frustrating, and time consuming. So first you have to complete one phase and go back. The project timeline was planned at the start and a releasable product was delivered only at the end of that timeline. So if one of the phase was delayed, all the other phases were delayed as well. And that's a typical waterfall model for you. To avoid this, project managers usually try to define all the requirements that they had in the earliest possible phases of the project. However, doing so by requirements definition in the first place is at the initial stage of any project, right? And was often complicated and there were many requirements that would change throughout the course of the project. And studies again have showed that in most extensive and complex projects, about 60% of initial requirements would eventually change throughout the course of the project. The separation into different project phases 
force project managers to estimate each phase uh, absolutely separately, even though most of these phases were worked on together and in parallel. So for instance, um, no reasonable person would assume that the development phase uh, would have to be finished before the testing phase even started. It, this is how exactly the waterfall method actually worked for, for so long. It's, that's how it has been working. Now the waterfall model can be useful, right? And for, for small and straightforward projects, it's very useful. But for bigger and more complex projects, it is highly risky and less efficient than the Scrum software development and delivery framework. Before the Scrum framework, sending our software back and forth between uh, various teams without the guidance of professionals with Scrum skills, obviously, uh, this made our work extremely bureaucratic. Okay, it was complex, it was unproductive, it not only affected the product, but also the implied morale and the commitment to our organizational missions. So if I sum this all up, the Scrum framework has literally changed software development by allowing teams to be more flexible, be more collaborative and efficient in delivering high quality products that really meet the client's requirements. Unlike the waterfall methodology, the Scrum framework embraces change and uncertainty, and it enables teams to adapt quickly to changing requirements and to deliver value to their clients iteratively. And this brings us to the end of this lesson. And we have discussed how before we applied Scrum, we had to plan all of the project beforehand, which was never really fruitful. So that's it for this lesson. We'll see you in the next one. Hello everyone and welcome back to another module. And in this one, we will discuss the second problem we faced before we applied the Scrum framework. Okay, And we'll start from the uh, weakness of the process improvement frameworks used before Scrum. The main focus of all those processes was on the self-serving organizational demands of leadership, including monitoring, including compliance and predictability, rather than focusing on serving clients well and increasing employee morale. Now, this resulted in fixed deadlines for software delivery projects and independent silos, leading to a lack of teamwork and commitment amongst different teams. The reason behind this silo mentality is matrix management, which creates functional and technical silos. And the uh, biggest challenge is delivering a software project without the Scrum framework. And borrowing employees temporarily from different silos created a lack of priority for ongoing projects. Definitely, that's how it, it was supposed to come out to be. And changes were treated as delays and it created a domino effect of cascading delays eventually. The McKinsey Quarterly article highlights the illusion of cost optimization beyond the matrix organization. And Gartner estimates that organizations worldwide spend over $600 billion dollars yearly to recover their IT systems from non-scheduled maintenance works and defects. <laughs> Without a mechanism in place to process, fix and learn from errors, technical debt increases and mistakes are repeated. So if I sum it up, it's a shift from a self-serving demands to devotion to serving clients and increasing employee morale. And uh, it includes a focus on teamwork and commitment. And it is crucial for any successful software delivery project. Implementing the Scrum framework in a widening matrix management can lead to efficient change management. That's the first important benefit of that. And it, it leads to impediment handling and error fixing, and it results in improved business value, sales, um, greater revenue and profits eventually.
And this is what the second problem was all about, that there was a lack of coordination before the Scrum framework between all the different teams working on a project. And this is something we need to consider before we jump into learning more about the Scrum framework. And that is it for this lesson. We'll see you in the next one with a third problem. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to another module. And in this one, we're going to discuss the third problem faced before the Scrum framework was put into work in my organization. In the past, the leadership used to make decisions in a way that frustrated many employees. They operated with an autocratic mindset, an approach where leaders overruled the democratic decision-making ability of their teams. Before the adoption of the Scrum framework and its processes, decisions were made by leaders who often lacked the combined intelligence of their teams. Now, this obviously excluded inclusiveness. These leaders made whimsical decisions that were not thoroughly thought through. Such decisions were often irrationally made and discredited the democratic decision-making ability of their employees. And this let these employees feel that they were left out of all this process. This situation made employees feel underestimated and marred their ability to come up with creative and innovative solutions to handle competitive business and software-related challenges. Furthermore, the software engineering teams were discouraged from giving their input when asked to contribute to decisions. Now, when you do this to a team, imagine the kind of stress they go through when they feel they're not a part of the whole system. However, the adoption of the Scrum framework in organizations sorted out these chaos and frustration elements. But the, but the Scrum process allowed for a more democratic approach in short. And it was to uh, help decision making and which has also eventually helped in empowering these employees. Now, the process ensures that the decisions are made by cross-functional teams and not just by the leadership. And the judgment maids are more thorough and thought through so that people who are actually having the expertise give a part of their feeling and experience in the decision making process. And if I sum this all up, the scrum process has actually changed the very way software services and products were actually developed and delivered in organizations for decades. Now, the democratic process of decision making, what does that do? It helps eliminate the autocratic decisions and empowering over employees' processes. Now, the employees feel like they're in control and they're part of the whole family of the Scrum work. Now, so this brings us to the end of this lesson and also to the end of this section. And we have discussed all the three major reasons why I think Scrum has really helped us improve software delivery and in short, the production of any product for that matter in organizations. So moving forward into the next sections, we are going to learn more about the Scrum roles and the Scrum teams. So stay tuned and thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to this exercise. In this exercise, we will analyze and discuss the problems faced before implementing the Scrum framework. And by the end of this exercise, you will have a better understanding of how the Scrum framework addresses these issues and improves the software development process. So let's get started with this exercise. I want you to divide your team into participants and into groups of four to five people each. Provide each group with a list of the three problems that are discussed in this exercise. Number one, planning the project before understanding it. Number two, lack of devotion and teamwork amongst different departments. And number three, autocratic leadership versus democratic leadership. For each problem, ask the groups to discuss the following. Number one, identify examples of how this problem may have impacted their past projects or experiences. Number two, discuss possible solutions to these problems and how the Scrum framework can help address them. Allocate a total of 10 to 15 minutes each for the problems discussion, followed by a five minutes break before moving on to the next problem. 
after discussing all the three problems in detail. Ask each group to choose one representative to present their findings to the whole group. Allow each representative five minutes to present their group's insights and proposed solutions. I want you to encourage a group-wide discussion, allowing participants to ask questions, share their thoughts, and provide additional solutions or recommendations. Now, I want you to also conclude the exercise by summarizing the main takeaways from the discussion and how the Scrum framework can help them address these issues. These are some of the expected outcomes. By the end of this exercise, the participants should have a better understanding of the problems that are faced before we implement the Scrum framework. And they should also know how the Scrum framework can help them address these issues. Participants should also have gained valuable insight from their peers and learn from their experiences firsthand as well. You may choose to pause this video before you continue to the answers section. Although there are no specific answers to this exercise, the main points that should be discussed include the following. The negative impacts of the waterfall methodology and how Scrum improves the software development process as a whole. Including also the importance of teamwork, collaboration and communication in a Scrum environment. We may also look at the uh, benefits of adopting a democratic decision-making process and also empowering teams. Also remember to encourage open discussion and allow participants to share their experience and ideas, as this will enrich the learning experience for everyone who is involved in this exercise. That is it for this exercise. We'll see you in the next section. Hello and welcome to this lesson. And in this section that we are starting right now, we'll be talking about the Scrum roles and the Scrum team. The Scrum framework is revolutionizing the classic triangle of project management. Now, in the past, organizations were forced to sacrifice one of three major things, budget, time, or quality. However, with the Scrum framework in place, a new triangle is emerging between budget, time, and functionality. And none of the elements have to be compromised for the project to be completed as a success, okay? And when we talk about the Scrum framework, the quality is no longer optional in this case. The Scrum teams try their best to provide the best possible software for their clients in order to help them and their businesses succeed. Now in this, the definition of done, the DOD, is used to determine when a feature is complete and meets the required quality standards. DODs specify the desired outcome in terms of functional and non-functional requirements, the designing, the coding, the unit testing, and user verification, for example, documentations, and more. DODs are defined at both levels of uh, user stories and tasks. Now, user story DODs focus on functional and non-functional client requirements, while task DODs focus on the desired working activities of the Scrum team members. The Scrum team is not permitted to close out any tasks that do not fulfill the DODs. The Scrum product owner and the Scrum team defines tasks additionally throughout the software development process. This accrual development allows the team to remain dynamic and adjust their next best actions in a monitored manner without really incurring additional costs and risks. The Scrum team builds a transferable software product accrual until the end of each sprint. Then the team demonstrates and discusses these accruals with the Scrum product owner, meaning the client, and the client stakeholders to get their views and add them to the next steps of the sprint. Flexibility is not only applied to the software delivery, but also to operational processes. The Scrum framework allows more efficient use of resources, be it human, time, budget, materials, and the minimization of waste as well. Studies have shown that the Scrum has positive effects in practice, such as improved team collaboration, increased productivity, better quality, flexibility, and increased customer satisfaction. While introducing and adopting the Scrum framework may be difficult in the beginning, the flexible and iterative approach of the Scrum framework 
handles the initial burden and copes better with ever-changing client and business requirements. In most cases, the Scrum framework is a better alternative to the classical software engineering methodologies. To sum it up, the Scrum framework has transformed the traditional triangle of project management by prioritizing what was really important, quality, and creating a new triangle between budget, time, and functionality. This framework offers flexibility and optimization of resources and has shown positive effects in practice. While it may be challenging to adapt, the Scrum framework is often a better alternative to all the other traditional software engineering processes. Hello and welcome to this module on Scrum roles and the Agile Scrum team. The Scrum framework identifies three key roles, the product owner, the Scrum team member, and the Scrum master. Now, a successful Scrum organization needs individuals with all these skill sets. These roles are indispensable, not replaceable, and should not be combined with other Scrum roles or functions. Each Scrum product owner typically works with one Scrum team, and each Scrum team has its own Scrum master, who works exclusively with that team. Now, understanding and employing these roles with the right talent is crucial. Often the root cause of a Scrum team's difficulties is either the lack of understanding of these roles or not employing the right people. Now, each role has a defined set of responsibilities. And only by fulfilling these responsibilities and interacting and collaborating and working together on a Scrum project can a Scrum project be completed successfully. Now, the Scrum teams are responsible for delivering all work to business clients. The Scrum team is a group of individuals collaborating to provide the requested and committed product increments. To work effectively, everyone within the team must do the following. Embrace the Scrum framework values, such as courage, focus, commitment, respect, and openness. They must follow the same norms and rules. Pursue a common goal that connects them to the IT and business outcomes. Setting up a new Scrum team requires understanding that it will not perform at its best immediately. It's not just switch on and off. The team must go through the Tuckman model stages, which are forming, storming, norming, and performing. The Scrum teams have some specific features. They share norms and rules. They have a collective accountability for delivery of the product. They empower each other. They have autonomy. They are self-organizing. They have a balanced skill set. And they have a small core team with no sub-teams. They have full dedication to their teams. And they have co-location. They are ideally located in one place. Now, there are some rules and norms that the teams go through. Scrum teams must adhere to certain norms and rules, either implicitly or explicitly. Some of these examples may be like Scrum ritual details, the clear definitions of done duties, prioritizing and estimating guidelines, and uh, documentation practices, tool usages, even coding standards, and testing and quality assurance practices. There may also be some rules for that. Uh, there may be bug resolution processes, uh, change request handlings, sprint review meeting preparations, even Scrum ritual or event outcome handlings, uh, meaning they should be following some rules in that as well. Backlog refinement meetings. These are things we will be discussing in detail for sure, but these are norms and rules that the team has to follow. Along with this, there has to be accountability. Now, the Scrum team as a whole takes full responsibility for completing the agreed upon user stories within the set time frame and highest possible quality as well. They must deliver that. The outcome, whether positive or negative, is always considered a result of the entire team's collaborative effort. So there's not one person responsible. The whole team is accountable. 
Also, there is empowerment and self-organization at the core of these teams. The Scrum team must have the authority to determine the following. The deliverables at the end of each sprint or duration of the work. The process of breaking down user stories into tasks. The assignments of specific tasks and their implementation sequences. Now, these are what the team has to do together. So the self-organization element comes in there. Now, by empowering the Scrum team to make decisions, the team members are more likely to be more productive and motivated in trying to serve the client's needs because they feel more inclusive. Along with it, they have a balanced skill set. Now, what do we mean by that? While each Scrum team member may have unique skills and abilities, focus areas and personal interests, but the team must possess a well-rounded set of skills to achieve maximum performance if they have to deliver a certain software. Now, this balance allows the team to tackle changing IT and business challenges and also help them to operate autonomously as much as possible. So, a balanced team with skill set is really essential. The Scrum team must also be composed of diverse roles. Maybe it will be designers, developers, uh, architects and more. And we must encourage team members to learn from one another's expertise as well. All members share the title of the Scrum team member, regardless of their primary skill sets. So a designer or a coder is still the Scrum team member. The Scrum team sizes are also typically small. And ideally, give and take a two from seven. So it could be five, nine. But typically, any more than this, an increased number of communication and alignment overheads come in then. However, the optimal uh, team sizes may vary for you, depending upon how you experiment and how your team adapts. But a five or a seven or a nine is a, is a suitable number for your Scrum team. Another important feature was that you need to reduce the communication overheads when teams are collaborating. It is ideal that they must be located together. If they are in multiple geographical locations, they must be separate team members, separate Scrum teams that I must say, and they have their, their own goals and user stories so that the collaboration within that area is easy. The Scrum team has distinct responsibilities, including number one, dissecting the user stories, creating tasks, determining priorities and estimates, and organizing these task implementations, which involves crafting, managing, delivering the sprint backlogs. They also have the responsibility of holding daily Scrum meetings. Along with this, the Scrum team must have daily Scrum meetings. They must ensure that a potentially releasable product increment is produced and showcased at the end of the sprint as well. Along with it, updating task statuses and remaining workloads, enabling the sprint burndown diagrams creations, Along with that, they must also be updating task statuses and remaining workloads, which helps them enable the sprint burndown diagram creation as well. We will also be looking into the details of how you use these diagrams in the later part of this course. But mastering Scrum can be a daunting task, but fear not. All the resources are designed to assist and guide you throughout the process. So as we go along this course, you're going to get better and better at understanding the core and how to apply the Scrum framework for making it an efficient part of your organization. Thank you for watching this episode. Hello and welcome to this module on the Scrum Master role. Now the Scrum Master is crucial in helping all participants of the Scrum project and also helping external stakeholders understand and apply the Scrum framework correctly. Their primary responsibilities include facilitating the Scrum process as a whole, fostering a new mindset and approach, and acting as an agent of change to develop new team norms and standards. Now, there are some key tasks of Scrum Masters. Number one, implementing the Scrum framework within their business and software development. Number two, acting as a change agent and supporting process adaptations to enhance the Scrum team's productivity. Number three, coaching the Scrum team to embrace the Scrum values. Also ensuring collective collaboration between product owner and the Scrum team. 
Also, they help in ensuring effective collaboration between product owner and the Scrum team. In addition, they help in resolving obstacles that impact work continually. Also, leading work progress through service. They also help in facilitating Scrum events and protecting the Scrum team from external disruptions during a sprint. Now, to perform these tasks effectively, a Scrum master should have excellent moderation and coaching skills. And not only that, he should be committed to continuous learning and inspiring others to grow. The Scrum master is part of the Scrum team and takes on a more of a servant leader role. Initially, their primary focus will be moderation and coaching. But as the team progresses, they can contribute to sprint goals directly as well. Building trust between the Scrum Master and Scrum team members is essential. Ideally, the Scrum team should choose its own Scrum Master, but often it's the management that makes this decision. It is crucial for the Scrum Master to not have line management responsibilities over the team members so that you can maintain an open communication and joint ownership of work and decision making. Guarding the Scrum team and removing obstacles is a vital responsibility of the Scrum Master. He has to protect the team from distractions and added unplanned work during a certain sprint so that they can be very productive. Now, the Scrum Master ensures that new user stories are stored in the product backlog until the next sprint planning meeting. They also will help remove impediments that hinder the team's progress, such as um, providing resources or finding missing know-how. Now, the Scrum Master facilitates the Scrum retrospective meeting, focusing on addressing identified shortcomings and measuring change. Now, facilitation of Scrum events is done by the Scrum Master, who is responsible for organizing and facilitating several Scrum events, including the backlog refinement meetings, the sprint planning meetings, the daily Scrum meetings, the sprint review meetings, and the sprint retrospective meetings. These were the roles of the Scrum Master, and in the next episode, we are going to learn more about the roles and the responsibilities of the product owner. So see you in the next episode. Hello and welcome to this module. And we are learning about the role of the Scrum product owner in this module right now. So the Scrum product owner is a pivotal role within the Scrum framework. And it helps by combining aspects of product and project management while also being deeply involved in the software development and delivery process. This role goes beyond traditional project, program, or product management roles and represents the end customers and stakeholders. The Scrum product owner is responsible for maximizing the value of the product by ensuring that the Scrum team delivers the right work at the right time. The key tasks of a Scrum product owner include, number one, managing and clarifying project requirements. Number two, guiding releases and ensuring return on investment, which is ROI. Number three, collaborating closely with the Scrum team to deliver work on time. Next, managing stakeholders and their expectations, and also overseeing the Scrum product backlog. While the Scrum product owner can delegate some activities, they still maintain the accountability for their tasks. The Scrum product owner is responsible for the Scrum product backlog contents, which includes creating, maintaining, and clearly describing user stories, prioritizing user stories to achieve business goals and fulfill the software product's mission, ensuring the Scrum team accurately understands and implements user stories. The Scrum product owner is accountable for achieving product goals, creating and maintaining the release plan, and making decisions about deliveries and user functions and their order.
They often manage the Scrum team's costs and budget, working with team members to refine, prioritize, and estimate user stories. Not only this, they also manage external stakeholders. Now, these external stakeholders should not directly communicate their demands to the Scrum team. Instead, the Scrum product owner collects and assesses required functionalities with stakeholders, combining, filtering, and initially prioritizing user stories before discussing them with the Scrum team. Collaborating with the Scrum team for a successful project is the core function of the Scrum product owner. He helps to communicate Scrum teams and work with them closely. The Scrum product owner is responsible for ensuring that the team members are informed and aligned with the goals of the software being built. During sprint review meetings, the Scrum product owner is the one who inspects, accepts, or declines the Scrum team deliverables. Now this brings us to the end of this lesson in which we've discussed about the roles and responsibilities of the Scrum product owner. In the next one, we'll be seeing you with more details about the Scrum team member. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to this module on the role of the Scrum team members. Now the Scrum team members are the ones responsible for implementing the software. Together, they determine the number of requirements they can confidently deliver during a specific product increment known as a sprint. A high-performing Scrum team typically possesses a diverse range of software engineering skills. This includes software developers, architects, testers, database administrators, and other team members who are working collaboratively on the project. In a Scrum environment, team members are no longer part of functional silos within a matrix organization. The developers are no longer solely part of software development competence centers, and testers don't exclusively belong to software testing competence centers only, and so forth. Hence, Regardless of their previous positions within the organization, members of the Scrum team now belong to their specific Scrum project. Their primary objective is to create the best possible software to fulfill the requirements of their Scrum product owner. The key characteristics of the Scrum team includes number one, empowerment and autonomy, cross-functionality, self-organization and small size, full-time engagement, co-located workspaces, a united and collaborative mindset. It is crucial to remember that the Scrum team members consistently adhere to the Scrum values, which are number one, courage, two, focus, number three, commitment, number four, respect, and number five, openness. Now this sums up the role of the Scrum team members and in the next episode we are going to look at a very important question and that is do we still need a project manager in the Scrum framework? We'll be addressing that question in the next module. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to this module and we are looking at if we still need a project manager with all the other roles in place. Now, a product manager usually defines the requirements and delegates their execution to a project manager, who then coordinates all the necessary activities to deliver the project requirements. However, the Scrum framework does not include a project manager role in the traditional sense. Instead, the tasks associated with this role are distributed between the Scrum product owner and the Scrum Master. Decision-making about functionality, release planning, and budgeting becomes more streamlined, efficient, and effective when one person handles the execution, control, and documentation of these activities. Otherwise, constant tension may exist between the Scrum product owner, who's not responsible for the project, and the project manager, who's not responsible for executing the work. The Scrum Framework, hence, aims to prevent this potential conflict, which could impact the functional and tactical management of the Scrum team's work. As a result, the responsibilities typically associated with project managers and product managers are now combined 
into the Scrum product owner role. However, the Scrum master assumes some traditional project manager uh, responsibilities as well, such as tracking tasks in sprints and facilitating the resolution of impediments. Since the Scrum master is part of the Scrum team, handling such activities directly within the team becomes more efficient and straightforward. And this answers the question that we do not need a separate standalone project manager when we have the Scrum framework in place. Now this brings us to the end of this section, do practice the exercises and quizzes. And in the next section, we will be discussing about the Scrum stories, estimation and DODs in detail. So see you there. Hello and welcome to our Scrum Framework Roleplay exercise. Now in this interactive video, what are we going to do? We're going to help you better understand the roles that are within the Scrum Framework and how they collaborate to optimize project management. This exercise will be fun and engaging and it will help you learn Scrum Master, Scrum Product Owner and Scrum Team Members roles. So let's dive into it. Let's look at scene one, which is setting the stage. Now in this, you're assuming that we are a scrum team that is working on a project. Now imagine you're part of a scrum team which is working on a software development project. Now your team obviously consists of a scrum master, a scrum product owner, and a group of scrum team members with diverse skill sets. In this exercise, you will have the opportunity to play each of these roles and experience their interactions firsthand. To perform this exercise, Follow these simple steps. Gather a group of participants to play these different roles. Assign each participant one role, Scrum Master, Scrum Product Owner, or the Scrum Team Member. Now use the scenarios provided in the following scenes to role play and practice communication and collaboration within the Scrum Framework. We'll also provide you some model answers to guide you further in this role play by the end of this episode. So let's look at scenario number one, which is sprint planning meeting. Now in this scenario, the scrum team is holding a sprint planning meeting. The scrum product owner presents a list of prioritized user stories from the product backlog. The scrum team members discuss and estimate the effort required for each story and select the ones that can be confidently completed within the given sprint. So I want you to sit down with the sample product backlog. Uh, you could make it up yourself and sit with your team and assume that you're in the situation of sprint planning meeting. And you can continue to see the sample answers after this. So take a break, sit down with your team and get started. So let's look at some answers. So as a scrum product owner, this is your, what you might say during the sprint that we have uh, two priority user stories, implementing a login system and developing a search feature on our application. Now, what do you think would be the effort required for these stories? The second member could say, well, let's agree to this and we can commit to completing these two user stories during the sprint. Now we'll be looking into role play in the sprint planning meeting. Now this is how you could role play the sprint planning meeting, but this is important to have good collaboration and communication within your team members, the scrum master, product owner, and the scrum team members. Now let's move on to the second scenario, which is daily scrum meeting. Now for this, you might be standing in a circle in your office, okay? In this scenario, the Scrum team is basically conducting a daily Scrum meeting. Now, each Scrum team member shares their progress, plans for the day, and any obstacles that they are facing. Now, I want you to model this daily Scrum meeting. Stand with your team in a circle, maybe, and come up with possible tasks, any obstacles that your members are facing, and role play this. And once you're done with it, you can come back to this episode and continue to watch the sample answers. Now I want you to do this exercise. I want you to role play the daily scrum meeting, have the scrum master facilitate the meeting, ensuring that everyone has a chance to speak out their heart and encourage the problem solving process during the discussion, okay? And I'm giving you a sample model answer or situation right now in the next few seconds. Welcome back. And now we're looking at some sample answers of this daily scrum meeting. Now, one of the members could say, yeah, yesterday I finished the login system and today I plan to work on the uh, front end. However, I'm facing a trouble understanding the API documentation. 
And the Scrum Master could reply that, um, thanks for sharing and I'll help you with the API documentation after the meeting so we can resolve this issue in time together because it's going to take longer if you start to discuss it right now in the daily Scrum meeting. Welcome and now we're looking at scenario number three which is the sprint review meeting. And this is a meeting in which the Scrum team is presenting their completed work eventually. In this scenario, what I want you to do is you have the Scrum team which is holding a sprint review meeting and the Scrum team members demonstrate the completed user stories to the Scrum product owner and gather some feedback. Let's look at what Scrum team member number one says. Let's suppose that we say we have completed the login system and we have completed the search features as planned and we have a demo ready in action. Now in response to this, the Scrum product owner might say, great job, the login system works smoothly, but the search feature could use some improvements in terms of speed and accuracy. So why don't we add a user story to the product backlog for refining the search feature in the next sprint. Now, this was a model answer I just gave you for a review meeting. I want you to now role play this. So get your team together and role play the sprint review meeting. Now, while you're having this, what you need to understand is that you need to have the Scrum team members present their work and the Scrum product owner provide feedback. It should be positive feedback, it should be negative feedback as well, so that you could obviously appreciate what's done right, you can obviously get back with what needs to be improved. Now let's move to scenario number four, which is the sprint retrospective meeting. Now in this, what you need to visualize is that you have a scrum team in a meeting discussion uh, who are discussing about improvements in the system. Now in this scenario, the scrum team is participating in a sprint retrospective meeting. The team reflects on their performance during the previous sprint and identifies areas for improvement for themselves. Now I shall read some model answer and give you an example. So let's suppose the scrum master says, Let's discuss what went well and what could be improved in our last sprint. And the team member one says, I think our communication was excellent, which helped us complete the user stories as planned. However, uh, we could improve our estimation processes because we could run a little late as we underestimated the effort required for the search feature and we delayed by three weeks. Now the scrum master might say, that's a great point. Let's look into the next sprint and let's allocate more time for refining our estimation process. So this is a sample uh, answer that you could be expecting to do. Now I want you to get together with your team and exercise this role play of the sprint retrospective meeting. Have the scrum master facilitate the discussion and encourage the team to identify areas for improvement of their working using the scrum framework. Now this exercise should have given you a better understanding of all the rules within the Scrum framework and their interactions. Now by practicing effective communication and collaboration in these scenarios, you'll be better prepared to work with a Scrum team and optimize project management. Now keep practicing and refining your skills. And remember that continuous improvement is at the core of the Scrum framework. Good luck and happy scrumming, and we'll see you in the next section. If you're not a subscriber, click down below to subscribe so you get notified about similar videos we upload. To get the course exercise files and follow along with this video, click over there. And click over there to watch more videos on YouTube from Simon Says It.